so friends, a big hello from today to Gorakhpur. Gorakhpur, known for Yogi Ji, Dr. Sadhana Gupta ma'am, uh, so many more stalwarts whom I just came to know. And now, uh, as the place where we first started our Rishta program in Uttar Pradesh. So Gorakhpur is going to hold a special place in my heart, undoubtedly. Uh, and this warm welcome that I have received is, uh, is really beautiful. It makes me feel so much at uh, home. So when we were designing the Rishta program, um, we realized that there is so much to speak about breastfeeding undoubtedly. But we also realized that the purpanium is a little bit of a neglected area. Like you know, uh, delivery ho gai, bacha ho gaya, and then you know like uh, bus nobody wants to speak about the purpanium. And uh, postpartum is indeed a quest back to yourself. Alone in your body again. You will never be the same. You are stronger than what you were. But of course, this period is going to be riddled with a number of problems also. And so we decided that let us have a talk on the surgical interventions during the pure period. So the objectives of today's talk are to define pure period, identify the various operative interventions that could possibly be required and find the right options surgically to manage the same. So puerperium is the six weeks period from the time of delivery of the placenta onwards. The immediate postnatal period is for the first three hours postpartum. So when we are so busy with the golden hour, we are busy uh, trying to breastfeed the baby, or baby ki cord uh, ko clamp kiya gaya hai, baby ka vaccination chal raha hai, everybody outside is happy that the baby is born. But there could be so many problems occurring with the mother during this time. The early postnatal period, which is the first seven days postpartum, and the late postpartum period, the postnatal period, which is the second week until the sixth week. It is an important time for the new mother and the newborn to recover from the birth process and for their physiological and psychological adjustment. Adequate follow-up of the mother and infant soon after delivery helps to prevent complications and promotes optimum health of both of them. So what does the immediate postpartum focus on? It focuses on looking for excessive bleeding. It looks at whether the complete placenta has been expelled. It looks for the contraction of the uterus. And of course, very important, whether lactation is being established or not. Friends, when I saw this diagram, I realized that nearly 50% of the deaths are going to occur after delivery and this is probably one of the most important time periods when we have to be really really watchful and make sure that our mothers do not lose their lives and not only mortality but morbidity also has to be very minimal. So we can see that uh, a number of causes you know whether it is infection, whether it is uh, uh, other cardiovascular conditions, non-cardiovascular conditions, hemorrhage, amniotic fluid embolism, so many causes for death during this time span. So we know that uh, um, a surgical intervention during this time span could be a surgical intervention of the uterus, but it can also be a surgical intervention on the perineum, it can be of the breast or it can be of any other organ. I'm sure all the esteemed gynecologists over here must have had you know, so many patients having acute cholecystitis immediately in the puerperium. And to begin with, you know, when you are younger and junior, you wonder why she is complaining of so much pain, pain. Especially, you know, if you are given fundal and things like that, you think that maybe the fundal is a little bit of pain, but we don't realize that it could be acute cholecystitis, acute appendicitis, so many, or you know, some kind of volvulus, any other complication can occur during the puerperium. But we are going to restrict our talk to only a few conditions today. Uh, infection, pelvic organ prolapse and hemorrhage would be the main points which we will be discussing today. So undoubtedly severe hemorrhage which occurs during the pure period, uh, whether with the placenta retained or with the placenta outside is something that we all worry about. So as I said, what are we are going to speak mainly about PPH, retained placenta, uterine inversion, the simple episiotomy and of course a breast abscess. PPH is defined as a cumulative blood loss greater than or equal to 1000 ml or blood loss accompanied by signs or symptoms of hypovolemia within 24 hours after the birth process. We know about the four T's, the tone, thrombin, trauma, tissue. 
uterine atony, uh, bits of placenta remaining inside, abnormal placentation and uterine inversion are some of the important causes of postpartum hemorrhage. I think you know this audience is very well versed. Uh, we, uh, we have so many uh, webinars going about on about management of PPH. What are the main causes? So although this is not the main aim of today's CME, we would like to just touch upon them. Uterine rupture, uterine atony, DIC, placental abruption, placenta accreta are the main uh, causes where you require surgical management of PPH. PPH today accounts for 27% of maternal deaths throughout the world and is thus one of the leading causes. We know that uh, the management of PPH can be divided into the medical and the surgical management. We are aware about oxytocin, carbitocin, methyl ergobatrine, tranexamic acid, prostaglandins, IV fluids and the massive transfusion protocol which is required in the management of PPH. Now looking at the surgical management, what do we need to look for? We need to look for the vaginal and the cervical tears, look for the injured vessel, uterine packing can be done, balloon tamponade, B lynch sutures, uterine artery ligation, internal iliac ligation and of course sometimes an obstetric hysterectomy may be required. Again, uh, the, the B lynch suture, I think I'm sure all of us over here, especially we have you know, esteemed faculty over here who are from the medical colleges, who are teachers and the B lynch suture is something that all of us have used and found it to be extremely useful uh, as a compression suture. It is recommended to use a number one delayed absorbable monofilament mounted uh, to a 70 millimeter semicircular hand needle which has an absorption profile that decreases with time 60% at 7 days to 20% at 14 days and with resorption complete between 90 and 120 days. The CHOSE procedure also identifies areas of the uterus you know which are kind of a tonic or which are bleeding mode and this technique involves identifying these areas of heavy bleeding and suturing the serosa of the anterior wall to the serosa of the posterior wall by stitches forming a square. This square suture requires the placement of four suture points by a straight needle mounted with number zero polyglactin. So these are the two most important uterine compression sutures which we all have been using to treat PPH. Uterine artery um, ligation, internal iliac ligation, I think each one of us has to learn and Foxy has made it their mission and vision to teach all of us about these uh, important procedures in order to tackle PPH and save the mother's life. Of course, all of us want to avoid an obstetric hysterectomy. But is it always possible? Sometimes in your own private nursing home where we have limited resources, you may have called your two, three friends to help you. But what we personally feel is that it is better to err on to the side of obstetric hysterectomy a little earlier than waiting for things to go too bad because then we have reached the point of no return and then even in spite of the obstetric hysterectomy we may not be able to save the woman because she goes into DIC thanks to the massive transfusions that she has required and thanks to her already deteriorated condition sometimes she has already gone into an arrest and so many other things so sometimes in a private setup uh, with limited resources it may be a good idea to err on the side of obstetric hysterectomy rather than lose the patient herself. What about a retained placenta? A retained placenta after vaginal delivery is diagnosed when a placenta does not spontaneously deliver within a designated amount of time, variably between 20 and 60 minutes of time. Once again, all of us have faced this situation. All of us know very well that we first attempt to remove the placenta, we give, the, we give a controlled cord traction, it doesn't come out. We give it a two, three more tentative tugs, it does not come out. Then we increase the rate of pitocin, okay, and then we give it another tug, but at that time the cord breaks. Okay, now the placenta is still inside. Then we uh, we try to do a kind of a manual removal of placenta. Most of the times, even with an anesthesia, the placenta is going to come out. But there are occasions where it is not possible to remove the placenta at all. And that is the time we have to give her complete general anesthesia, relax the uterus, wear those long gloves, insert the whole hand inside, find the cleavage between the placenta and the wall of the uterus and try to shear it off. Most of the times we do manage but this is again an important cause of postpartum hemorrhage and can be quite problematic. Here I want to uh, discuss one very important, one beautiful case which we just tackled maybe 10 days back. This was a young primate 
who delivered at 35 weeks of gestation and absolutely full term normal delivery. And uh, you know, everybody is chatting in the labor room, everybody is happy, all is well, well, in spite of it being 35 weeks, it was a 2.2 or 2.3 kg baby, baby was doing well. And suddenly we realized that the placenta is just not coming out. We did all the possible things, you know, you give her pitocin, um, maybe you might, you might want to give her a little bit of prostrodine so as to uh, help the placenta to get expelled. The cord broke as expected. We tried a little bit of manual removal just like that, it just wouldn't come out. Then we gave her GA and we tried for removal of the placenta but believe me friends, the placenta refused to come out. And the funniest part was, she was not even bleeding. Now comes the question, patient is stable, she is not bleeding. Uh, we are unable to remove the placenta in spite of giving her general anesthesia. We decided let us step back and just let us think as to what we want to do in this particular case. So we just stepped back, we kept monitoring the patient and we called a friend for help. He was a very senior obstetrician who along with knowledge has a lot of practical experience also. And guess what he told me? Charu, don't do anything. Just leave her alone. I said, what? Leave her alone? How can you say this? You know, the placenta is inside. I can see it on ultrasound. I can feel it into my hand. I have barely removed one third of the placenta. And you are saying, leave it alone. What if she bleeds? He said, don't worry. Just do her counts tomorrow because you feel like doing them. Just monitor her. Uh, see the fundal height. Keep a watch on her pulse BP. And at the end of 48 hours, let her go home. And believe me, friends, I trust this friend of uh, doctor friend of mine so much that I sent her home, but with very, very clear ideas that uh, she has to report immediately if she has extreme pain in lower abdomen, if she starts bleeding, if she develops fever. We gave her good antibiotic cover and we were calling her morning, evening because it's the first time I had ever done something like this. And lo and behold, on the fifth day after delivery, she sends her first photograph of that small bit that doctor this small bit has come out and my stomach is hurting quite a bit. So, uh, you know, otherwise she said, I'm just fine. I'm not bleeding excessively, nothing at all. And within four hours, the complete placenta was out. So this was a new learning experience for me that we can have a touch me not kind of an approach also for retained placenta, but only if she is not bleeding, only if the patient is cooperative and we also have that much, you know, it is done in good faith. If the patient understands that this is what we are doing. And then I met the discussion with my friend. He said that he's treated nearly 20 cases like this. All have been very successful. And one placenta came out six weeks <coughs> later also. So uh, we did a few, uh, you know, we read up a little bit. And we found that there were some small, uh, um, you know, uh, what do you say, low volume case based studies. Which told us about this kind of a retained placenta which can be left behind. You know, injecting oxytocin <coughs> through the veins. Uh, all these also has been mentioned and everybody says, no, you must go in and get it out. But this was a new experience which I, which I thought I needed to share with all of you. Uterine rupture is a complete division of all three layers of the uterus, endometrium, myometrium and uh, the serosal layer. And uh, there are so many causes of complete uterine rupture which we all know about. Um, probably uh, in, in metros, I don't see too much of uterine rupture unless it is a previous uh, unless it has been a, a large myoma which has been removed and the endometrial cavity has been opened, uh, that is the time when we also do see uterine ruptures. If it is possible, we have to try to suture the uterus back, otherwise it is an obstetric hysterectomy that she is going to land in. We all know that the complications to the mother and the baby are definitely there. And now coming to lacerations. So lacerations are a pattern of injury in which the skin and the underlying tissues are cut or torn. Lacerations can occur spontaneously or iatrogenically as with an episiotomy on the perineum. Uh, um, and so, you know, an episiotomy is a surgically planned incision on the posterior peritoneum and the posterior vaginal wall during the second stage of labor. So we all do it so routinely. To give or not to give is a million dollar question. But can we have a show of hands as to how many of us uh, give episiotomies routinely? No? No? You don't give? Wow. Superb. I think that, that is what is really recommended. But I don't know. Um, maybe we don't wait so long or what. But we give episiotomies to each and every patient. But I think if you are following the practice of only selected episiotomies, that is really fantastic. Because even this episiotomy can cause a lot of problems. Uh, but in now Pune, we have only primary brothers only. 
<laughs> nobody wants to take a second chance also <laughs> single baby after the age of 34 35 so rigid perineum obesity <laughs> rightly said so <clears throat> episiotomy if done too early there will be a lot of blood loss if done too late it fails to prevent the invisible lacerations of the perineal body the posterior vaginal wall the superficial and deep transverse perineal muscles bulbous sponges and parts of the levator are now going to be cut the fascia over them a few nerves and of course the subcutaneous tissue and skin we all are very well aware of the steps of the perineal repair a good exposure good lighting close all the dead space ensure hemostasis you uh, you know chote mops mat use kijiye you know which might get left inside and restore a good anatomical um, uh, alignment to facilitate healing use minimum suture material do not over tighten the tissues and a pr is quite mandatory in each and every patient of episiotomy uh, we use uh, these uh, vicral rapid and sometimes chromic catgut uh, to suture the episiotomy we all know about the complications of an episiotomy extension of the incision to involve the rectum vulval hematomas infections you have to of course look after it properly and for this again the rounds on the the, the, the round uh, after the delivery is so important because you know the, the patient is complaining of pain on the perineum and what we tell her or the staff tells her ah ha to cut lagi hai to thoda to dukhne hi wala hai we don't realize that sometimes can be a large hematoma which is developing and we have to pay attention to perineal pain asap wound dehiscence rectovaginal fistula and sometimes necro necrotizing fasciitis can occur dyspareunia chances of perineal lacerations in subsequent labor and scar endometriosis at times we can just skip this uh, we all know that whenever there is massive pph the massive blood transfusion pro protocol has to be ready uh, you have to call people for help um, this is a little beyond the uh, today's lecture so we will not be discussing it uh, we have to give her pain management uterine inversion again another complication which can commonly occur reposition is uh, not difficult at all i'm sure most of us have done it manual reduction for uterine inversion sometimes she can go to vasovagal shock because of this is something that we have to remember hydrostatic reduction for uterine inversion has been mentioned and of course if that doesn't help then you have to do a laparotomy and you have to hold the round ligaments and pull up the uterus so now something very close to my heart this 32 year old underwent a full term c section for fetal distress 10 days back and now she's complaining of throbbing pain in and a lump in the left breast uh she she says that she has fever uh and she has pain during breastfeeding on examination you find a tense tender hot fluctuating lump in the left breast upper outer quadrant there is a cracked nipple the right breast is also engorged and you make a diagnosis of a left breast abscess so uh, i think uh, madam may be discussing this case in detail but uh, i just want to mention over here that uh, today we want to uh, make a special mention that uh, we no longer do incision and drainage of breast abscesses uh, we just do uh, syringing we just remove the pus just give a little bit of local anesthesia to the skin take a large bore needle an 18 number needle and ins insert it over there it can be done under ultrasound guidance also we as members of the breast committee today are encouraging our gynecologist friends that aap jaise khud man se tvs karke follicle monitoring seekhe aap khud kitni cheeze seekhe to why are we not hold using that small uh, probe which is used for small parts and just see if you know there's a breast abscess it's whether it's abscess it's mastitis kya hai kya nahi so the more we keep uh, we put the, the that small probe onto the breast the more we understand how the normal breast tissue looks like and the more we will be able to do these kind of uh, drainages under ultrasound guidance also So these are very very important uh, things that we have to remember that uh, unless it is a very large abscess, we will not be doing IND because it leaves an ugly scar. It separates the mother from the baby, and uh, the dressings are very painful. Instead of that, you just aspirate the pus, send it for culture, send the mother back home, give her antibiotic and painkiller cover, call her again after three four days, and believe me, it works, friends. You know, even I used to think, "Hey, नहीं ये कैसे काम करेगा? कितनी बार आएगी वो? हमेशा हमेशा आती रहेगी." No, that's not how it is. And if you really hold the probe, you can see the small pockets of pus which are left, and you can put the needle out there and drain the pus. So, I think because of paucity of time, we shall 
we have to also remember that inflammatory breast carcinoma is a rare differential diagnosis of breast abscess. So I shall just uh, run through these slides. So under ultrasound guidance, because usually these uh, abscesses have got septate. And uh, we all just discussed that why does it occur? It is essentially because of improper breastfeeding techniques and not starting breastfeeding in the golden hour. So uh, I think prevention is better than cure. Let us prevent these abscesses from uh, forming by uh, uh, adopting good breastfeeding techniques. So friends, as we wind up, the puerperium is an oft neglected time period. Nearly 50% of maternal deaths occur during this time span. Surgical interventions may be required for the uterine, the cervical and vaginal causes. Other organs like the breast may also require to be looked after. Anticipation, prevention and readiness to tackle them will go a long way in reducing maternal morbidity and mortality. And finally, we realize that whatever we think, it is only Ram Lalla who is going to be able to help us. So we have to pray to God and we have to make sure that our prayers are in place our intentions are good and we are doing our practice in a clean ethical way and then we will, uh, we will be saved from any kind of litigations and so many other problems. Thank you so much friends for having me over. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to interact with all of you. Thank you.